Hello, on today's episode of Intern Crash Course, I'm discussing community-acquired pneumonia. Let's run through the common presenting features of community-acquired pneumonia. Historical features that argue in favor of CAP include dyspnea, cough, particularly if it's productive, fever, and chills, while features that argue against CAP include a sore throat and rhinorrhea, both of which are associated with upper rather than lower respiratory tract infections. Exam findings typically include tachypnea, tachycardia, hypoxemia, and fever. Focal lung findings include dullness to percussion, decreased breath sounds, bronchial breath sounds, crackles, and egophony. And on labs, the white blood cell count is usually elevated, but can rarely be abnormally low when the pneumonia is severe enough to be accompanied by septic shock. Also, a protein called procalcitonin has been found to be a nonspecific biomarker of bacterial infections. Importantly, a diagnosis of pneumonia requires both a combination of clinical features and consistent imaging findings. You should never make a diagnosis of pneumonia in the absence of lung imaging of some kind unless you are seeing patients at a location where imaging is just not available. To understand the treatment, you need to be aware of the common microbial etiologies of CAP. The most common is Streptococcus pneumoniae, more commonly known as pneumococcus. Other causes include Haemophilus influenzae, Mycoplasma, Chlamydia pneumoniae, Legionella, Staph aureus, with MSSA being more common than MRSA, and a variety of respiratory viruses, most notably influenza. The frequency of specific organisms is dependent upon the season, geography, patient population, and the severity of illness. I'll take a moment to discuss a few confusing points of terminology. Atypical pneumonia refers to a pneumonia in which systemic symptoms, such as fever, malaise, and headache, predominate over respiratory symptoms, such as dyspnea. The chest x-ray shows interstitial or patchy opacities rather than lobar ones, and the illness is often but not always relatively mild in severity. Atypical bacteria are bacteria that grow poorly in routine culture media, including mycoplasma, chlamydia, and legionella. Unlike other bacterial causes of CAP, atypical bacteria are also intrinsically resistant to beta-lactam antibiotics. Although it's more likely, saying that a patient has atypical pneumonia does not necessarily imply the pneumonia is caused by an atypical bacteria. And atypical, whether referring to pneumonia or to bacteria, does not imply uncommon. In fact, atypical bacteria are actually very common etiologies of community-acquired pneumonia. One sort of related term that you will hear from time to time is walking pneumonia. Because of ambiguity with what it means, it's not a useful medical term and should be avoided altogether. Finally, healthcare-associated pneumonia, or HCAP, is an outdated term that should be avoided. This new category of pneumonia was originally introduced by guidelines in 2005 and led to an increase in inappropriately broad antibiotic coverage, exposing patients to avoidable side effects and promoting antibiotic resistance. So as of 2016, the category of HCAP is no more. So now, what should be included in the evaluation of a patient with pneumonia? As already mentioned, pneumonia cannot be reliably diagnosed in the absence of a chest x-ray although there is a very small number of patients with clinical pneumonia and an initially unremarkable chest x-ray who will subsequently develop radiographic pneumonia over the next several days following illness onset. All patients warrant a CBC and basic metabolic panel as an elevated white blood cell count supports the diagnosis, while a low hematocrit and high BUN are negative prognostic markers that should be incorporated into triage decisions. During flu season, obtain a nasopharyngeal swab to test for influenza. A nucleic acid amplification test, including reverse transcriptase PCR, is felt to be superior to antigen-based tests. If severe pneumonia is suspected, an ABG is appropriate. A low PaO2 and low pH are also both negative prognostic markers that might impact the subsequent location of care. And most patients with pneumonia severe enough to warrant inpatient admission also warrant an ECG, as a number of cardiac etiologies can present with acute dyspnea and even cough, and because pneumonia can trigger several arrhythmias.
Now for some tests that are sometimes appropriate, but generally overordered. First, procalcitonin. Because it is believed to increase in response to bacterial infections and not viral ones, it's frequently ordered to determine if antibiotics can be safely withheld. However, the 2019 joint IDSA-ATS guidelines on community-acquired pneumonia specifically recommend against this practice. This is due to the observation that there is not a specific procalcitonin threshold which can reliably distinguish between bacterial and viral etiologies. Those same guidelines recommend testing for pneumococcal and Legionella urine antigens only in patients with severe pneumonia, or in the case of Legionella, if there is association to a possible outbreak. Blood cultures, sputum gram stain, and sputum culture are recommended only for patients with severe pneumonia, a history of prior MRSA or pseudomonas infection, and those who have received intravenous antibiotics within the last 90 days, and those patients who are being empirically treated for either MRSA or pseudomonas for some other reason. Last, clinicians occasionally order multiplex respiratory viral panels on specimens obtained via nasopharyngeal swab in order to distinguish between viruses and bacteria. However, the literature on this practice is sparse, and pneumonia guidelines, they don't mention it at all. So I just mentioned this term, severe pneumonia, which might have seemed like a vague term to mean a pneumonia that's really bad, but in fact, there are specific criteria used to define it, which will be relevant when I discuss treatment. The two major criteria for severe CAP are septic shock and respiratory failure requiring mechanical ventilation. The nine minor criteria, respiratory rate of 30 or more, a P to F ratio under 250, multilobar infiltrates, confusion, a BUN of 20 or more, an abnormally low white count, a platelet count under 100,000, hypothermia, and hypotension responsive to IV fluids. Severe CAP is said to be present when at least one major criterion or at least three minor criteria are met. In addition to the severe CAP criteria, there are two clinical prediction rules that are frequently used for prognostication and triage. The simpler one is called CURB-65, which is an acronym. C for confusion, U for uremia, R for respiratory rate, B for blood pressure, meaning hypotension, and patient age of 65 or more. In its common use, a patient with zero to one of these points is treated as an outpatient. With two points, they are either admitted to an inpatient unit or to an observation unit, and anyone with three or more points is admitted to inpatient. The other clinical prediction rule is called the Pneumonia Severity Index, or PSI. You may still hear some older physicians refer to this as the PORT score for Patient Outcomes Research Team. I'm not going to read through it because it's obviously more detailed, but in comparison to the CURB-65, it places greater weight on the age of the patient, makes a distinction in risk between the two sexes, and it places significant weight on elements of the past medical history. But like the CURB-65, the higher the patient's score, the more acute the recommended location of treatment. Despite its added complexity, the IDSA and ATS recommend using the PSI over CURB-65 for determining which patients can be safely treated as outpatients, while the previous severe pneumonia criteria are best used to determine the appropriateness of an ICU admission. Now, let's discuss antibiotic treatment. These are also based on the recent IDSA and ATS guidelines. Treatment is divided into four categories. Outpatient without significant comorbidities, outpatient with comorbidities, inpatient non-severe, and inpatient severe and or ICU. For each category, I'll mention the preferred options and then some additional considerations. For outpatient without comorbidities, preferred options include doxycycline and amoxicillin. At first, the amoxicillin might seem to be a strange choice here since it doesn't cover atypical bacteria at all, the guidelines acknowledge this and reference outcome data demonstrating the effectiveness of amoxicillin nonetheless, which to the best of my knowledge has no great explanation. An additional consideration is that a macrolide such as azithromycin can be used, but only if the local rate of pneumococcal resistance is under 25%, which is essentially nowhere within the United States. The next category, outpatient with comorbidities. These comorbidities include heart failure, chronic lung disease, 
cirrhosis, CKD, alcohol dependence, active malignancy, asplenia, and diabetes. Preferred treatment options here are the combination of either amoxicillin clavulanate, also known as augmentin, or cephalosporin, such as cefpodoxime, with either a macrolide or doxycycline. An acceptable alternative to this is monotherapy with a so-called respiratory fluoroquinolone, which includes levofloxacin and moxifloxacin, but not ciprofloxacin. For inpatients who don't meet severe criteria, a moderately broad intravenous beta-lactam is preferred, such as ampicillin solbactam, known as unison, or ceftriaxone, plus a macrolide or a respiratory fluoroquinolone as monotherapy. The clinician should add MRSA coverage and or pseudomonal coverage if the patient has significant risk factors for those pathogens. For those with severe pneumonia, most of whom should be admitted to the ICU, recommended regimens include a beta-lactam plus macrolide as above, or a beta-lactam plus a respiratory fluoroquinolone. No monotherapy here. And once again, add MRSA and or pseudomonal coverage in the presence of risk factors. The duration of antibiotic treatment should generally be five days or until clinical resolution, whichever is longer. Exceptions to this include MRSA and pseudomonal pneumonia, which experts recommend to be treated for at least seven days and sometimes longer. What are some of the reasons that a patient might fail to improve? Insufficient time has elapsed. They've been prescribed an inadequate antibiotic dose. They are infected with a resistant organism, such as MRSA. They are infected with an unusual organism, such as a gram-negative rod, tuberculosis, or PCP, among others. They have inadequate source control, for example, an undrained empyema or lung abscess. Or maybe the diagnosis of pneumonia is incorrect. The most common diagnoses to mistake for pneumonia are pneumonitis, heart failure, pulmonary embolism, and a COPD exacerbation. Some final considerations. In cavitary pneumonia, that is, a pneumonia characterized by one or more cavities on chest x-ray, consider tuberculosis, fungal infections, and nocardia as possible etiologies. In immunocompromised patients, also consider TB, fungal infections again, nocardia, and PCP. Empiric anaerobic coverage in cases of suspected aspiration pneumonia is no longer recommended. Although there has been some research into the use of steroids in pneumococcal pneumonia, guidelines at the present time recommend that steroids should only be used in the presence of refractory septic shock. And last, follow-up chest x-rays to confirm radiographic resolution of pneumonia is generally not necessary for most cases, but you should consider a chest CT in smokers who meet guidelines for lung cancer screening.